if anybody else listening is having the experience I'm having right now where I, I, I have a pit in my stomach mm. because I have at least one person, very prominent person that I have in my mind in my life. And I'm like, check, check, mm -hmm. check, check, check. Somebody's talking at the table. They're rolling their eyes mm -hmm. at other people. Somebody leaves the room. They just immediately mm -hmm. trash them as they leave. What I want to know is we'll get into what to do, but now that you're really kind of pulling apart the signs mm -hmm. and we've learned that there are sort of two tracks in childhood where this behavior and this personality type is made, mm -hmm. what is the impact if you have a parent mm -hmm. that is like this? Like, as in, like if you've been raised by somebody that exhibits all five of these or you're like, oh my God, I think my mom or my dad was a freaking narcissist. Like check, check, check. How does that impact you now that you're an adult? So it, it's not good. That's oh, the best God. answer I can give you. It is not good. So let's remember two things. First of all, I'm going to add a 5B to that list. Look for entitlement. Like that idea of they won't wait in line. They're, they're special. They expect special treatment and they get really angry if they're not given special treatment. That's another sign to look for. But Check. let's remember this about narcissism. It's on a continuum. Not all narcissists are the same. So a person who is dealing with more of a, what we call a milder, lighter narcissistic person is having a very different experience than somebody who's dealing with a rather severe narcissistic person. And I think that what that has sort of muddied the waters in this conversation, because if a person dealing with a milder narcissist hears the story of somebody who's dealing with a really severe narcissist, they're saying, well, maybe I'm not dealing with a narcissist because I'm not living in terror. You know, I'm not isolated from all my friends. I still think that person dealing with a lighter narcissist is still feeling unseen, unheard, self-blaming and all of that. It's just at a different level. The reason I bring this up is with the parents, right? I do think that any narcissism in a parent is never good for a child. Um, but at the more severe levels, it's absolutely devastating. What it does is it hijacks a child's sense of self, identity, autonomy. They, they don't believe in themselves. They believe that their needs are not, in fact, they've been shamed for their needs their entire life. How, what, you want something from me? You know, like that's what the parent's attitude is. Maybe not that explicitly, but People who grow up with narcissistic parents, the vast majority become rather anxious adults who are not aware of their own self-worth, who have very inaccurate um, self-appraisal, usually in the wrong direction. They do they devalue themselves entirely. They don't trust themselves. They downsell themselves. They don't aspire to things that they actually could do because in some ways they've so internalized the way they were shamed by that parent. But above all else, they sort of lose their entire sense of self because their parent never let them develop it. Because in essence, the parent really experience the child as an extension of themselves. When the what does that mean when, so, when the child's the extension of the parent? So it means that the child should have no needs outside of that parent. So if the child goes along, everyone gets along. If they're, mommy, mommy, you're so pretty and we'll do anything you want and they eat the way the parent wants and they do the sport the parent wants and they excel at what the parent wants and they they're just become literally the parent and have no identity or need outside of that. Everything's going to be just fine, but that's not how kids work. The whole point of being a child is to individuate and become autonomous. And once that happens, the parent is not interested in that and they don't like it. So the child will always feel that they're almost in psychological servitude to that parent. They're not allowed to have a reality outside of the parent. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about this sort of whiplash because you know, when you're dealing with a narcissistic parent or spouse or boss, it feels like I keep reading these comments from our audience mm -hmm. about like, on one hand, you're like, okay, there's the tantrum behavior, but you still feel responsible for them. You still feel guilty when you're mad at them. You still mm -hmm. want to please them. Correct. Why? Because that, that, there's a guy named Daniel Shaw who writes about this brilliantly, and I want to credit him because I'm going to use his language. He he talks about, and it's going to use a technical term, and I'm going to bring it down to what all of us, how we'd make sense of it. He calls having a narcissistic parent, he calls it a loss of intersubjectivity. That's a real fancy way of saying, it's my reality, it's my way. You 
are you're almost like a non-entity here you everyone exists to serve me i don't want you to have needs i don't want you to be something separate in a healthy parent the child will be sad and the parent will sort of even if the child parents in a good mood the child will stop and be with their sad child and, and listen to them and empathize whereas a narcissistic parent will say um this is my birthday what is happening here like wait you're not get this kid away from me like well, how dare he cry on my birthday it's that kind of thing right so you the child is not allowed to have any sort of experience outside of that of the parents and then the ch and the parent really expresses the resentment at the child having needs thus the child internalizes a sense of shame and even guilt over having needs so when they go into adulthood that shame and guilt persists because that 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 relationship a lot of therapists don't address it that explicitly it's not an easy cycle to end because remember unlike an adult narcissistic relationship the child needs the parent the child needs the parent for safety for shelter for food it's not like you can divorce a parent and say i'm going to start dating again and see if i can find someone better that is not how this works the child knows the parents the only game in town and identity is very much shaped by that attachment relationship by that caregiving parental relationship so what you're learning is that you're a pain in the neck don't need so much you're not good enough because if you were good enough that parent would be regulated that parent would be happy so you're doing something wrong and the narcissistic parent explicitly and implicitly communicates that to them I yes. wish you'd never been born I, you're so much trouble I would have had such an amazing career if it weren't for you the child shouldn't be hearing that they'll shame a child's weight like oh goodness so somebody's eating too much it's your because you're a bad reflection on the parent if you don't look the way the parent wants if you're not doing what the parent wants oh my kid uh, he wants to play a violin he won't even play sports all of those things are the child is supposed to be a functionary for the parent and so as that person goes into adulthood i would actually say it's almost a three-part whiplash there is the sense of you know what the tantrum is you see it coming mm -hmm. you then have the experience of is this my fault? I need to calm them down. I feel bad. And then you have the third experience that you may still have some good moments with that parent. Yes. That parent may be really smart, really interesting, really fun. I mean, in fact, a lot of people say, as I got older, there were parts of my parent I enjoyed because I noticed there was something fun, but I still felt the shaming and the blaming. And it's very interesting for a lot of narcissistic parents they like babies because babies are sort of like an accessory, like a bag. You can kind of take them around, like, you know, and show them around town. Once they stop being baggable and carryable, not so interested in them, not so cute on social media, then there's this huge long period where that child needs more than it can give back. Then the child gets into late adolescent and early adulthood. The parent's interested again. They can go out to dinner with them. They can go to a bar with them. They can go on an interesting vacation with them. They can bring them into the family business. And so now they're interested in their kid. And for some kids who desperately wanted that love, they go all in on that. They're like, right. oh, I'm going to play tennis with my dad or I'm going to, I'm going to help my mom in her business because now, now, now I'm going to get, I'm going to get that love, the love you wanted when you were four and you couldn't quite work in the family business. So now that, now, now that trauma, and that's where we get to this idea of the trauma bond. Okay. Let's talk about this because I, 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 I know that what's happening as you're listening to this is you're probably going ding, 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 ding. And we're focusing on parents right now, but we are going to get into romantic relationships. But I think it's an important distinction that with the parent child relationship, mm -hmm. you are there, like you don't have an option. Have an and option. so what do you do now? If you're sitting there listening to this and you're going, Oh my God, that's me. And I do keep jumping back into the fire. Mm -hmm. It's like this, are they super hostile? Or, you know, are they loving me? Did I get it right? And now I'm getting affection? Or um, are they trying to annihilate me because they're not getting what they need from me and I'm not behaving? So right. as, an, as an adult now, if you're going, this is me, what do you do? So a couple things. All right. Number one, I am not going to sugarcoat this and say there's like three easy steps to pushing back from a narcissistic parent. This ain't TikTok, folks. Like this is hard work. Okay, there is no three step, five step, 10 step, or even 172 step plan here. Okay, it is. I'm gonna take a deep breath because <laughs> I, <laughs> I need every one of you to hear, this is not TikTok. Okay. You no. need to wake up and realize that, first of all, you're not changing the weather in Chicago. Mm -mm. 
and you're not going to change the personality type if your parent is a narcissist or you are in love with one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So number one is the acknowledgement. And this is the hardest part of all. Although you're this person's child, narcissistic people view all the people around them as objects. Like my coffee maker or my tea maker. This morning I made a cup of tea. I don't think about my tea maker unless I want a cup of tea. When I want a cup of tea, me and my tea maker interact. The rest of the day, don't think about it once. At all? At all. Why would I? I don't need a cup of tea, right? And that's how a narcissistic person result thinks about other people. Do I need really? something from you? Yeah. Do I need something from you? Oh, yeah, I do need something from you. Now you're my central focus. I'm thinking about you, only you. But just like if that tea maker waddled over to me and said, hey, could you listen to me? I'd be like, what? You're a tea maker. Like, go away. This is not Beauty and the Beast. Appliances do not talk. Get the hell away from me. You are a tea maker. Learn your place. So for a narcissistic person, we all serve a function for them. Whether it's your their lover, whether you're their accountant, whether you're their cleaner. That's why narcissistic people always have like a team around them. It's always about the team. I'm like, of course you have a team around you because everyone serves a function for you. I'm trying to pick my mouth up off the floor because this is a revolutionary idea for me that a narcissistic person isn't ever thinking about you unless they need something exactly. for you. Exactly. And yet, if you have ever been in a serious relationship with a narcissist mm -hmm. or you were raised by one, you think about them all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the time. All that you're ruminating them. They're not thinking about you unless they need something from you or you're a blockade to something they need, right? Like you're not signing the deal or you're because you're sick, they can't go to something. Now they're thinking about you because they're mad at you, right? But it's, it's so it's going okay, back I'm to your so, parents. I'm, sorry. I'm like, Going back to that parenting issue. So as you get into adulthood, you are an object to them. So like, what can I do? What can I do? I, you, you're never going to be able to read their mind and give them everything they want. There is not there. You will never be able to. None of us are mind readers. You're never going to be able to fully anticipate. And what's so sad is people who are all in with narcissistic parents or even narcissistic partners will. Will literally try to devote their lives to anticipating the narcissistic person's every need so they can finally, finally win them over, that they could do it just right. So that's not possible because none of us are mind readers. Remember that? So what do you do? You give up. You, you have, you, at that point, you're like, okay, I, I can only be the best person I can be. Live in a way that's in line with your own values, right? Now, this is why I'm saying that this is not an easy TikTok strategy because even as you do that, even when the day comes, you realize, my parents never going to end, but my parent is never going to change. None of this is my fault. It's really just my genetic bad luck that this is the parent I pulled. Yeah. Um, again, I am not responsible for any of this. I need to stop taking my bucket to an empty well. They are never going to notice me. They are never going to have empathy for me. I cannot live my life as a sacrifice to them and forever keep trying to please them and not living my own true authentic path. All of those things are important. Here's the part that I'm saying is never, this is just the work is, and then when you tell your parent, no, I'm not coming to dinner this Sunday. I'm not, I didn't feel good last month. I'm taking a pass. Really? You're not coming? I was making that special thing and I really miss you and I'm thinking of you and, and, you know, I'm getting older. 90% 90, 90 of people are going to break under that one and they're going to show up and guess what's going to happen at that dinner again the criticism, the humiliation, the devaluation, the invalidation, right? So I say to people, you got two options here. Either be with the, the guilt of saying no or go to the dinner with realistic expectations that when you, and almost make it a game, like a personal bingo. You know, it's not quite a drinking game because if you took a shot every time they invalidated <laughs> you, you'd be loaded before the main course came. But if you, I, I literally have done this where I'm like, okay, I'm going to collect points at this dinner for every five invalidations. I'm going to go like, I'm going to get a scoop of ice cream or I, and then like, and then it's like a little thing that pays out during the week. Like Tuesday, I'm going to get ice cream. And on Thursday I might get a massage. Like 15 invalidations is usually a massage for me. And so I'm like, I'm objective. Yeah. Too. And I'm like, I'm gunning. I'm like, do it again, do it again, do it again. We're 13. I really want the massage. So, so, so let me ask you this question. So should you ever, confront a narcissist like somebody's going to come mm -hmm. listen to this podcast and be like all right that's it i'm calling dad nope nope 
I can if we if we only said one thing in this entire podcast episode is never ever call out a narcissist we, we would be giving the single most brilliant piece of advice why do you never call out a narcissist uh, I should I'm going to temper that with it depends on what you want if you're doing this because you want to say it's like a gotcha moment haha I see you okay and they're going to rage at you and they're going to scream at you and there might be a smear campaign now and they may be telling everybody out there that not only are you an ungrateful kid but you are the narcissist and you're the one who's harmful and everybody needs to keep their distance from you and, and uh, I mean they will really do such a number on you that and they're not going to change so if all it is for you to say I see you I think the better way to do to play that is you see them now change your behavior stop being supply for them stop engaging with them stop taking the bait so are you saying if you call home and the first thing out of somebody's mouth is haven't heard from you in a long time you should not say you know the phone works both ways no way no if you know this person's narcissistic absolutely not so they say haven't heard from you in a long time and you'd say no you haven't oh and well, and then where are they going to go with that? Because what you've done is you've taken away the volley. They're playing tennis. You need to play solitaire. Can you give us some other role plays? Um, so put, put another conversation starter out there for me. Um, uh, why don't you come to Thanksgiving? Uh, and, you, and, the, your, and the assumption in this one is why don't you come to Thanksgiving as this person's committed s fully to not yeah, going they, this year. Every, they, you got to come to me. Okay. So you go... This is where, and I'm going to step back before I role play that. I'm going to introduce the concept of true north. Okay. The true, true, north. true north. Okay. True north is a big healing, what we call healing technique for folks, or at least it's a more of a management technique than healing, I should say. True north is that you need to figure out what in your life is worth fighting for. So maybe you're not going to Thanksgiving this year, not only because you don't want to see them, but it's your, your, your kids playing football that day. All right. Yeah. And you do not want to miss that football game or you have you do actually have a big deadline at work the Monday after Thanksgiving and you want to get it done or you said tack with it this is the year we're actually going to go to you're going to go camping or we're going to go to Hawaii for Thanksgiving okay yep. you're, because that's what my family has always wanted to do. my you know you, whatever your friends you're, you've decided to take a trip with your friends your true north is what is healthy for you okay so you've got to be clear on that it sounds like it's a balance between how much guilt can you tolerate Right? Kind of. It is and it isn't because the guilt is people feel guilt. People feel guilt when they believe they're doing something wrong. Oh. So to which I'd say, what did you do wrong? You feel guilt if you committed a crime. You feel guilt if you stole something. You feel guilt if you cheated on someone. So when people, my clients tell me all the time I feel guilty. I'm like, tell me what you did wrong. And that's when I get the pause. They're like, I don't want to go to Thanksgiving. I'm like, where's, I'm, I'm sorry. So help me understand where that's wrong. Well, that's what they want. I'm like, I hear that, but how is that wrong? Because the axiom to that is not doing what they want is wrong. Okay. Everybody, did you hear that? This is a huge takeaway. So if the lights are going off in your head and you're, and you're starting to go, wait a minute, I definitely either had a parent that had some narcissistic personality or I'm in a relationship with somebody like this. The reason why you feel guilty is because if you don't do what they say, that's wrong. Correct. That's exactly. You and think that's what you, you are trained to believe. You are trained to believe that is. And if you had a parent like that, and let's say this is even happening in your, your committed relationship or your marriage, then that's another time when you were, you were almost indoctrinated into believing not doing what another person wants is wrong. And I, I like make the argument about it for me. This is foundational. Mm -hmm. Like, because what happens is the tantrum throwing. Yes. The shaming, mm -hmm. the gas. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Like all the adolescent mm -hmm. tantrum Correct. behavior. Adolescent, toddler. Yeah, is what actually has trained you mm -hmm. to believe mm -hmm. that not doing something that that person wants is wrong. That's why you feel guilty. That's why you feel guilty. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. How the hell do you get rid of that programming? Well, first of, first of all is one of the only paths forward to healing is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? That's I it. don't like that answer. And I know people don't like that answer. And I'll tell you why. Everyone goes to the damn gym and they lift the weights and they do the this and they're crossfitting that and, and they're in pain. 
because they want a hot ass or they want abs or they want arms. They want to look good. Why are you willing to tolerate pain there and you're not willing to tolerate pain here? Pain's pain, folks. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I thought I had learned everything there was to learn about narcissism from you, but I'm having major breakthroughs right now and insights. Uh, so should authentic or empathetic people, how do we protect ourselves from narcissists in life? It's a tough one. I, I think that it's every so often, Mel, every so often, and they're like that perfect seashell that's not cracked you find on the beach. I find these people who've actually never encountered narcissism. <clears throat> I find these people who have never encountered narcissism. They had two loving parents. They grew up in a happy home. They love all their siblings. They met someone in college. They fell in love. They both got good jobs. I hate these people. I'm no, just kidding. Yeah, no, I, well, I, <laughs> I, 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 I do. I, I wish this was I, everybody, I'm happy honestly. for them. I'm happy for them. And those people just, like, you talk about narcissism to them, and I could be talking about, like, the, you know, like, just some sort of, like, they think I have a tinfoil hat on. They really do. And I get it. I get it because they have absolutely no schema for that. But going back to the world of the authentic and the empathic, that's also, especially the authentic folks, it's a rare group. Being authentic, here's the thing about authenticity, Mal, and something we lose, and I think it really gets brought into stark relief when we're talking about narcissism. People talk about authenticity like it's an easy thing. The hardest thing in the world is to be authentic because to be authentic is to be unpopular. To be authentic is to blaze your own trail even when other people are cluck clucking at you and stigmatizing you and looking, giving you the side eye. What are you doing? Like people don't do that. You know, you're supposed to do the sort of missionary position, follow the rules kind of life. And authentic people say, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. Authentic people are very clear on their values, what they stand for, what matters for them. And so I'm not saying that authentic people don't feel guilt. They'll feel tremendous guilt, but they'll also feel committed to the potential within them and the people they care about. And to say, ultimately, giving in to this person's abuse is not doing, honestly, me any favors for sure. It's not doing my kids any favors. It's not doing the people I care about any favors. And it's actually not doing them any favors because it's reinforcing them in this sick cycle. And I don't want to be part of this. So we've got to get away from the idea that authenticity is easy. Authenticity, authentic people actually often have smaller social networks than other people because they, they've called away all the dead weight. They've cleared away all the branches that are, uh, that are dead. Like they, they said, no, I will not have people around me that are unhealthy, that are invalidating. I mean, it's, it's, it is a brave stand and it's not an easy, easy stand. And some people will say authentic people are selfish. They're cold. They're um, uppity. They'll, you know, that they'll, they'll really paint them in like, oh, who do you think you are that you get to do that? And all the authentic person is doing is trying to draw a boundary against unhealthy people. It is not easy to do because a lot of people feel like you got to go, you have, you have to put up with the unhealthy people. That's what we do. Families stick together and all that kind of stuff. And to which I say, no, I mean, why would we punish a person for, again, genetic bad luck for the rest of their lives? Mm. Is it normal for people to listen to you and start to worry Am I a narcissist? Because I'm also sitting here going, oh, my God. D like, have I, I, do I, I, I kind of sound like this sometimes, like, when I'm frustrated. Like, is this me? Like, now I'm starting to worry. Like, did this get, like, ah, uh, is, is this my personality? So here's the thing. Not all of us, all of us, and sometimes even every day, have moments when we're not graceful. What we need to look at is how quickly and how authentically we make amends. So if you snap at someone at work, that you catch that and within, you know, very quickly say, uh, that was not okay. I am, I, I, I take responsibility for that. You, you know, you were not responsible for that. I was having a bad day, but that's not your problem. And so I apologize that we, when we, when we do those things now, no narcissistic person in the world is ever going to do that unless a publicist makes them or, <laughs> and then it, you can it, tell, and then you can tell, do it. or, or, um, because they're trying to save face or they'll say my favorite, the, the narcissistic apology, which is, I'm sorry you feel that way. 
that's how narcissists apologize. I'm sorry you feel that way. Oh, I'm like, oh, hell no. The minute I, say, I hear that, I'm like, this conversation's done. And I don't storm off. I usually, I'm very, you got to learn your sort of like nod, Mona Lisa smile and, and say, you know, I got to jump. Now, some people say that's passive aggressive. Well, there's no, there's no path forward. And if right. I'm not in the mood for a fight, you'll say, you know, okay, you know, I got to, I got I, I to jump. Thanks again. Are we, and then close off the conversation on whatever else needs to get done. Now, before we jump into the dynamics of romantic relationships mm -hmm. and narcissism and how to, how to know whether or not you're dating one or you're married to one, although I'd suppose if you're married to one, you probably know it, but can you talk a little bit about family roles where there are narcissistic parents? I found that to be fascinating. Yeah. So in a narcissistic family and, and is assuming there's more than one child and even if there's not that child could still be placed in a role we have some sort of classical roles that kids fall into and roles are never healthy in a family system because in a way you can see that each of these child children are either being put in the role or have taken on this role as a survival need versus a child just getting to be a child right mm. so the number one classical role sort of the golden child right this is the child who has been anointed by the narcissistic parent it could be that that child is it resembles the parent the child is um, getting a lot of validation from the world. They may be good at something. And so that they're, they're the one who is, you know, always, you know, I don't know, doing well at sport or people like them or they sing well or whatever it may be that the parent is like getting a lot of validation. So they make that child the golden child. Now, usually to have a golden child, you need another sibling to sort of create that dynamic because that other child's not the golden child, right? So it's clear they're sort of a chosen child in the household. Go, do golden children remain golden children permanently? Not necessarily. If there's a point at which the golden child decides to step out of ranks or do something that aggravates the narcissistic parent, they will, the crown shall be removed from their head. The other, the other pr primary role in these families is the scapegoat. Hmm. Now the scapegoat gets the worst of it. And I would say in some cases, the scapegoats get it so terribly in narcissistic families, they come out of childhood look with something that looks like complex trauma. They are constantly criticized compared to other kids. They're literally not given one kid's tuition will be paid for and the scapegoats will not. The scapegoat will be expected to get a summer job to help the family. The golden child will get to go to some special camp. Like it's it's a stark market difference. The scapegoat will endure abuse that other siblings in the family don't um, don't endure. Why is the scapegoat the scapegoat? It's hard to know. It, mm. it, I've heard every reason in the book. The scapegoat simply knows they're the scapegoat. And it is actually a, because the scapegoat is a terrible legacy to take into adulthood because they will forever wonder why, what was it about me? What the, do you have to say to somebody who's listening saying that was me? You know, I would, I, we, we do, we will, we'll start with trauma work, you know, validation of their experience. Cause for a lot of scapegoats, they were told you were treated no differently. So uh, we, we start with straight up, you were treated differently what that happened. And that's the foundation. And you, you kind of jump, you keep grow from there and that this was real. And, and that then you explain to them how narcissistic families work and how narcissistic personalities work. Cause ultimately it wasn't their fault. Mm. wasn't the scapegoat's fault. Um, the next type is what I call sort of the helper. You know, the helper child is almost like a sort of a personal assistant. They are constantly exhausting themselves to do things for the parent. They may watch younger siblings. They might try to keep the house clean. They'll And they'll feel like they have to do this, not to be like a responsible player in the household, like everyone doing their part, but because they feel that this is the only way to get seen, recognized, or avoid the narcissistic parent's abuse. Another type of child we see is the fixer. The fixer is, is almost like this mini diplomat who's trying to insert themselves in at all times, trying to make sure, like for example, if you have a narcissistic parent and a non-narcissistic parent, there can be really terrible verbal abuse, sometimes even violence, but more verbal emotional abuse. And that fixer child will constantly be inserting themselves. And they're almost like a court jester to keep the um, parents from fighting. They will be, um, they will stay up l later than they want to, to make sure that the parents don't argue. They'll try to, they'll often sometimes even fall on the grenade so that there's not, they'll, they'll sometimes try to protect the uh, scapegoat. So that's the fixer. One thing that really struck me in what you're saying is, having one parent versus two, I guess I just assumed there was always one. 
Oh, there can be two? Two, two narcissists, narcissists are attracted to each other? Oh, heck yeah. Why? Flashy, superficial, grandiose. We're going to be the greatest thing ever. We're going to save the world together. I'm hot. You're hot. Let's go be hot and save the world. You don't think those people are drawn together? Oh, actually, that's true. You see them all over social media. Social media, L.A., all the time. And those that's a nightmare scenario for a child because nobody they only pay attention for their children when it's a good social media moment like i'm a mom blogger and they've got their sort of teeth whitened kind of husband smiling and, and the children are in white shirts white shirt who puts a child in a white shirt i don't think i i never owned anything white for my children now they're like in their 20s so no but they've got the white shirt and the white teeth and the look at us and but then when the cameras are off not so interested in those kids anymore. That's true. And kids know when it's phony. And kids know when it's phony. Exactly. And so they, and that's a new way. This is a first generation of kids that were raised from social media, with social media from front to back. Yep. The, the, the data now needs to be collected. That's, but we've now also, but we've forgotten about the, the, uh, the truth teller. The truth teller that is a profound child in the, in the narcissistic environment. This is the kid who sees it and gets it. And they don't have a vocabulary for it. In some ways, they're a bit horrified because they're like, oh, God. And the truth teller struggles. The truth teller may have fantasies of like, oh, my gosh, I wish this parent would leave. Or I hope they never come back. They're terrible. This is awful. Now, the truth teller can overlap. You'll have scapegoats who are truth tellers. You'll have helpers. The helpers, not so much. The poor helpers are sort of like lost in their trying to make mom a martini kind of thing. But the scapegoats can sometimes be truth tellers. But the truth teller can sometimes ultimately be scapegoated because in a weird way, the narcissistic parent almost has this sense that that little kid has their number. And it brings up a lot of shame for that parent. So they'll try to silence that child and almost do the equivalent of almost like um, excommunicating them, like putting them in the cheap seats and ultimately, like I said, scapegoating them. And then every so often there's the brainwashed child who thinks the narcissistic parent is just great and doesn't see it even into adulthood. And wow. when other siblings say, you know, mom's a narcissist and they'll say, don't say that. She gave up everything for us. You know, you're too selfish to see. So they're like, they're fully in the cult. So I'd, I'd ask everyone first to consider something that is both so obvious, but I always find it very powerful. Your body today is the exact same body you were born with. Wait, what? Right? Like your body, my body, has lived all of my experiences from the time I was a baby, right? We never get a new body. And so my experiences in Can my I first- Can I ask a question about that though yeah. first? Because don't you, because I like have heard all this stuff like your cells regenerate every seven years. And, uh -huh. you know, I've grown obviously from a blob that laid around yes. when I was an infant to now a five foot eight, 54 year old adult. So what do you mean when you say your body right now is the same body that you had when you were born? I think, yes, a lot of things have changed. Our house, our, like it's our, it's our house. We live in it. And so the things that happened when we were three months, when we were nine months, when we were three, things that you just said, Mel, it's true. We don't remember when we use a very limited definition of memory. And I always find this interesting. We have a very limited understanding colloquially of memory that it's the things that I can tell someone happened to me. Mm. But the only things we can ever tell someone happened to me are the things that other people help me form a coherent story about. And so that's actually a pretty limited amount of memory, given that the hardest things in our childhood were probably the things we were left alone with and nobody helped us understand. And we didn't even understand. Exactly. We didn't understand because we need adults when we're young to make meaning out of all of our confusing experiences that our body registers. Can I give you a specific Please. example that you might be able to help us unpack? Yeah as context for what you're talking about. So just last night, I was at LAX, and we were gonna fly to New York City, right? And so we are sitting in the Delta Club Lounge, whatever, if you have an American Express card, they're not sponsoring the show right now, but you know, that's why I was in there. And I went up to the concierge lady to ask about the flight status, and a woman came running up, and she worked at the Delta Club, and she was shaking. And she said, there is somebody screaming at a baby in the, in the bathroom. She's screaming at the baby, and the baby is so little. And I immediately tensed up, 
And the woman at the desk started to dismiss her. Well, is is the baby okay? I don't know, but you shouldn't talk to a baby like that. Why do you scream at a baby? Scr- like just, mm. s- the woman was in such distress yeah. over what she had heard yeah. from the tone of the mom screaming to the, to the like, why would you be screaming at a nine month old so loud it's coming through a bathroom door? And then she turned and the mom kind of rushed back out to where her partner was and handed her partner to the baby and was handed the baby to the partner and was all flustered. And can you in yeah. that moment explain what was probably getting absorbed by the baby, by the baby's mother, by the woman who heard it, by me hearing it? Yeah. That one moment was so triggering for me and clearly that other woman. Yeah. But explain all of that as it relates to memory and as it relates to experience, and as it relates to kind of how we get re-triggered. Yes. Okay. So I should first say the body doesn't only kind of wire, develop circuitry from one experience. But let's just say for the sake of this example that this baby and mother, this was one of many times when the baby is distressed, the mother struggles to tolerate that distress and ends up adding their own distress and dysregulation Um, rather than a soothing element. So I'm just going to make that assumption just for the sake of this discussion. So here's what's happening in a baby's body. Their emotional world inside is on fire. Something is very upsetting. And with a nine-month-old, you don't know what it is. Maybe their diaper is dirty. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they have some tag. Maybe it's they're noticing unfamiliar surroundings. They don't know how to express it except for in this total cry and dysregulation. So the baby's body registers... I am very overwhelmed and upset right Mm. now. I always think of like a marble run. That's like the first part of the marble run. And then how a baby's body ends up getting wired. What happens next is a baby will encode how their caregivers responded to them in that moment. So first comes distress. So their body learns, okay, I get distressed. As we all know, guess what? We all get distressed. That just happens. After distress comes more distress and anger and a threat to attachment and fear. So now a baby wires fear and additional dysregulation next to their dysregulation. And again, let's say this was part of a larger pattern. And babies, yes, they pick up on kind of the message, my parent is as scared of my overwhelmed state as I am. When I get overwhelmed, I push people away. When I get overwhelmed, I overwhelm other people. When I get overwhelmed, my closest relationships actually become threatened, right? So if we fast forward, and again, this is not one time, many times, right? Here's what doesn't happen. A 30-year-old doesn't say, I'm upset. And wow, I did get yelled at a couple times when I was a baby in the Delta Lounge, but that was then, and this is now, and I have a feeling my partner will respond differently, so I'm just going to go to them and say I'm upset. No, because again, that was never even explained to them. There's no coherence. It's just a body's memory of when I get upset, I actually develop a warning sign. Oh, you better put that away. Oh, you're going to threaten other people's attachment. This is going to make it worse. It's going to be a tornado. It's going to be an abyss. And then maybe even have a partner who's like, you seem like you're having an upsetting day. And they're like, no, 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 all good, all good. And then probably, as we know, I act it out in some other way. I pull away or I drink alcohol or I do different things because what I've learned is I can't connect to other people with my distress. I don't expect the people who are close to me to help me get soothing. So I better figure out what I can do now to shut down this experience to preserve feeling safe in the world. Wow. How the, I mean, I, there, there's so much to unpack here there's, because you don't even remember experiences probably five and under, right? Well, and this is, I think this is one of the most empowering things to think about. We don't remember with our words and our stories, but we remember with our body. So let me, like here, I always think about this couple. They saw me a while ago in my private practice and it was the dad who actually sought, you know, kind of this parent coaching work. And he said, whenever my kid has a tantrum, like I know the things, I know it's normal. I know they have the feelings. They don't have the skills. I have to teach them the skills. It's not the feelings that are the problem. It's the lack of skills. I know the whole thing. But when my kid has a tantrum, that knowledge is just 
out the door. And I, I yell. I say awful things. I say things I promised myself I would never say as a parent. And so one of the things I like to do when I'm working with parents is we can't just say, okay, try this. Because you can only try a strategy if your body is in a grounded place to be able to access that strategy. Is that why... It's easy to talk about tools and therapy, but when you get into the situation where your kids are driving you crazy, you start screaming and you forget the strategies. Yeah, it's why so many parenting approaches, I think, kind of set parents up to feel bad because they're like, try this, try this. That's great. And I always think if we learn those strategies, they kind of live behind a door. But if we aren't doing the work on ourselves to be able to be in the place to open that door, then they're just locked behind the door because we're triggered, right? So this dad, I I remember saying to him, tell me a little bit how your parents responded to your tantrums and your big emotions as a kid. And he's like, well, how, you, I have no idea. I, how, I, I, have, I have no memory of that. And I found this interesting because what I said to him, I go, I know how your parents responded. It's interesting you say you have no memory. Your mind doesn't remember. Your body is acting out that memory every time your kid has a tantrum. Your body, the way it reacts to so harshly shut down my kid's tantrum. He's like, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. You're making a big deal out of nothing. You're being ridiculous. Why don't you act like your sister? Like he'd say all these things. And he's like, I don't know how people responded to my big emotions. Uh, Dr. Becky, I was just sitting here thinking, I don't know how they responded. Our triggers are stories from our past. Everybody, did you hear that? I'm going to say it again. Our triggers... Our stories from our past acting themselves out in our present. And this is why when people say, what about all the types of therapy that like don't really care about the past? Or why do we have to talk about our past? I'm a pure pragmatist at heart. We have to talk about the past to understand it so it doesn't take over the driver's seat in our present life. That stinks when your past lives itself out. Can I ask another question? Cause, yeah. Because I have heard a bazillion times. And I talk about it, I've studied it, about how the body keeps the score, the Mm -hmm. body remembers, you feel things before your thoughts can explain them. But the way that you just talked about memory, something clicked. Mm. And the fact that my lived experience is also that I don't remember. And I also have this hyper drive, Dr. Becky, to go, oh, it was great. Yeah, I don't remember anybody yelling at me. I don't remember, like, anything like that at all Mm -hmm. and yet the thing that I hate about myself as a parent is that when I get frustrated I vomit on my kids Mm -hmm. I just snap and their moments of high stress cause me to be like right at them and then I quickly apologize I quickly am like I'm sorry it's a bad it's not an excuse that I'm stressed out right now yeah but is it normal to not remember what your parents did when you were like emotional? A hundred percent. So it's normal to not remember in this one version of memory that we all kind of accept as the whole truth, right? So going back to our body. So a kid gets yelled at. They're three. They get yelled at. Like we all know, like, I, by the way, I yell at my kids too. And I'm going to yell at my kids later today. Like we all do it, right? I'm stressed. It's not them. We don't respond to our kids. We respond to the circuit in our own body that gets activated when we witness things in our kids. Okay, everybody, I want you to hear that. You're not responding to your kids or your dog Mm-mm. or your colleagues or your spouse. You're responding to something in your body that gets activated in that situation. Exactly. So my kids, let's say with this dad, he's like, this kid is having a tantrum, uh-huh. right? And an example was like a classic four-year-old tantrum. Um, you know, I cut the grilled cheese in half instead of leaving it whole. <laughs> or I cut it in half as triangles instead how of- How dare you? You know, how dare you, you horrible parent, right? And And by the way, for the kid, that's also a trigger moment for them. They obviously were filled up with frustration and that was just the spillover point. But I see this thing in my kid. Then my body does this inside. What do I know about overwhelming kind of extreme displays of emotion? And my body kind of scans its circuits. And if I've learned 
in my own past, oh, no, 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 no. That is so dangerous. That would get you sent to your room, which is fear of abandonment. That would get you called a spoiled brat. That would get you those, and I know this from doing it as a parent, that would get you those dart eyes that just say everything we need to say as a parent. Mine's a tone shift. They're like, you are a horrible person, right? Which kids are like, oh, no, this is literally dangerous. Kids need us to survive. They need us to get food, shelter, and water. So they pick up on what feelings and parts of them are allowed and what feelings and parts of them are threatening and they adjust accordingly so if I had to learn in my childhood oh yeah those big displays of emotion even if I don't remember with my you know language yeah that would never have been allowed then my body scans itself when I have a tantrum that I'm witnessing for my kid and then here's actually the most I really think the most compassionate and game-changing part It's not okay that I yell at my kid. Definitely not. And yet, my body is essentially saying, oh, I'm trying to help my kid. I'm like, no, shut that down. That is so dangerous. Now, I'm still living in 1975 when it was dangerous for me, (laughs) right? But my body is actually trying to help the situation. Hi, Poppy. Hi, Mel. How are you? I'm great. Lay it on me, Poppy. Okay. I have a question for you. Um, So, like, how does one turn off that voice that's you know, been programmed into our head, um, telling us that, you know, our needs, our emotions don't matter and we must cater to theirs. So like, how do you turn that off? Okay. It's an excellent question. And you don't turn it off. You have to lay a new soundtrack. So if you think about the default mindset, almost like a playlist that runs in the background, that it's almost hard to make it go silent. It's much easier to put a new playlist in there. Right. And so there are two things that, uh, two tricks I'm going to give you. So okay. number one, well, before I get into the tricks, I just want to acknowledge something. Great job recognizing that the default thinking doesn't serve you in your life now. So the fact that you recognize, wow, I have this way of thinking that I don't want in my life and I'm going to do something about it. So that's enormous and it's amazing. Can you tell me what does this default soundtrack sound like? What does it say to you? So it says that, you know, Whenever I put myself first and don't put, you know, other people first, I'm selfish. Or if I want to do something for myself, it's never going to succeed. Now, did did somebody tell you that? Yes, my parents, actually. All right. So thank you for, for, like, admitting that. And the reason why your parents told you that is because their parents probably told them that. And so they probably thought that they were protecting you. And instead, they sentenced you to a brain and a way of thinking that makes you feel terrible. Right. And so when you can recognize who the programming comes from, It also helps because then you can separate yourself from that voice because it's not your voice. It's your parents' voice. And you have a chance to break this chain. You have the chance to be the one that this playlist dies with. You have the chance to create a whole new way of thinking and talking to yourself. And that's incredible. And so the first thing that you said is that you have a belief because somebody programmed this into your mind that runs on default that putting yourself first is selfish, correct? Right. How does that impact your life? Um, I get burnout, basically. Mm-hmm. If you could program a different belief, what would the belief be? That, you know, um, I'm 
but worth it basically it's okay for me to take care of myself it's okay for me to have emotions it's okay for me to just be me yeah oh i love this your whole life's about to change because not <laughs> only is it okay i deserve to feel how i feel right. like the main mantra i want you to have is i deserve to be happy does this make me happy I deserve to feel happy. Does this make me happy? What would change in your life if you started to tell yourself over and over every single morning when you start your day, I deserve to be happy today? What would change if you believed that happiness was something you deserved? Wow. Um, I think that my day-to-day -day would be a lot better, basically. I would actually, you know, get to cross off all the lists that I put down on my to-do list. I would have self-confidence. I would be able to go out and have a great day with friends. I, I notice that I hold myself back a lot because of what's been programmed in my head. And I'm done with that, you know? Well, I'm glad you recognize it. That's a huge step. Most of us sleepwalk through life. And don't even realize that we have been trained as little kids to make everybody around us happy and that it's your job to make people happy. It's your job to keep people satisfied. It's your job to make sure nobody's disappointed with you. And part of the problem is, is that underneath what, what your story is, which is it's selfish to put myself first, you have an uglier story. And the uglier story which I recognize because I had this one too, is people will be mad at me if I put myself first. There will be consequences if I do what's good for me. And so that's what you're really wrestling with is that you've connected taking care of yourself with somebody pulling their love away. Yes. And that's why you're scared to put yourself first. This goes way deeper. And so you're doing fantastic on behalf of all of us by recognizing that your own thinking is holding yourself back. And I can, I can tell you're just sick of it. And so here's what you have to start to do. Number one, I want you to name the voice. Name it? Yeah. Give it a name. Uh... Sally, Sue, Jocko, Raul, oh. uh, Michael. We got to name this thing. Oh, boy. Um, Vicky, I guess. <laughs> Vicky. Okay. So when this default programming comes up, you're going to talk back to Vicky. Okay? Okay. And literally, you can even physically, when you feel yourself holding yourself back, that's the signal that this is default programming. You're going to turn toward Vicky. Let me like, literally, I want you to like turn your body and you're going to look as if Vicky's there and you're going to be like, shut up, Vicky. Right. Now I want to hear you do it. Shut up, Vicky. <laughs> yeah. But if you, uh, don't make your boss happy, nobody's going to love you. Hmm. Tell her, shut up. Shut up. If you uh, don't do exactly what your parents want, they're going to be disappointed. Shut up. Say it louder. I don't believe you. Shut up. Say her name. Shut up, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to believe this shit Vicky's saying, right? Nope. What do you want to believe? In myself. Yeah. Your parents want you to be happy. They don't know how to make you happy. So they're just telling you what their parents told them. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what people do. You are now an adult. You're not to blame for the crap, the malarkey, the garbage, the gunk, the generational trauma shit that your parents put in your brain. You're responsible now that you're an adult for reprogramming this. And so whenever your mind tells you something that you don't want to think, shut up, Vicky. I don't believe that. I believe that if I'm happy, my parents are going to think they won the lottery. 
I don't believe that. I believe that if I put myself first, I'm going to do better work. Shut up, Vicky. What the hell? You're not paying my rent. Shut up, Vicky. You're not going right. to the party. I'm not taking you with you. There's no plus one on this invitation. Shut up, Vicky. Like by, by distancing yourself and talking back to it, it loses its power over you. And what also starts to happen is the filter in your brain, the RAS, it's now noticing, oh, you actually care about empowering yourself. And you're going to see more and more reasons to put yourself first. But it really does start with, you got to delete that song. Shut up, Vicky. Shut up, Vicky. Shut up, Vicky. On the playlist in your mind from the past. And you've got to insert the new programming you want to run on default, which is, I deserve to be happy. My parents are proud of me uh, for being me. Nobody's disappointed in me. And if they are, I'm an adult. I can freaking handle it. And... I got to start taking care of myself because I deserve that. Those are your beliefs, period. And whenever you start to feel like, here you go, holding yourself back, shut up, Vicky. And you'll notice the more you do this and you take ownership for programming your mind, the less Vicky's going to show up. Okay. I mean it. Right. I really mean it. If you believed in yourself, what's one change you would make that would improve your life? I would be less intense, I would say. Why are you intense? Because, um, well, just a little story for you. Like, I'm an immigrant, mm -hmm. and so are my parents. And they are very tough on me. They're very toxic because of, you know, culture, and they feel the need to raise me a certain way. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, living in America, what they're doing to me is very toxic and abusive. So I'm just like, always living on the edge, basically. Yeah. And if I could just, you know, embrace myself, I think I would be a more relaxed person. Yes. So are you open to some coaching? Yes. So um, a couple things I want to say about this. I agree with you. And when you take on the job of programming your mind to work for you, you will be happier. You will relax. And the reason why you're intense is because you have been trained to believe that at any moment, something could go wrong. Right. And that's your lived experience. That is real. That happened. And that is what happened during your childhood. And it will also help you if you can lose the word toxic. Like unless your parents are abusing you, and I don't know that they are or they're not. But if you lose the word toxic and you amplify a little compassion... And you say, hmm, I'm not saying what my parents are doing is right. I'm not saying that uh, they didn't cause issues for me emotionally and mentally and psychologically, but they did the best that they could. And I bet it was kind of hard to immigrate here. And I bet it was hard to feel like an outsider. And I bet the stakes felt really high for them. And they felt like outsiders. And they felt like they couldn't mess up. And I bet they took all of that stress that was their lived experience and out of fear and love, they aimed it at you. Right. And the reason why I want you to drop the word toxic is because I see this word thrown all over the internet. And it's a very divisive word, particularly if you want to improve your relationship with the people who are engaged in behavior that feels toxic. And so I think your parents probably did the best they could with their experiences in life and with the situation that they were in, and that if they truly understood what it was like for you as a child, they'd be mortified and horrified and they'd feel terrible. Is that a fair assessment? Mm, I guess for some parts. Okay. Okay. So I don't want to have you have to go in through your whole family history, 
But if there's, you know, abuse and that kind of stuff, then yeah, that is toxic. And you do need boundaries. And you'll figure that out with your therapist. But when mm-hmm. it comes to not adding more pressure on yourself, adding a little compassion so that it doesn't feel so personal and accepting the fact that this was a form of like emotional abuse for you, that you stressed you the hell out. You have this toxic stress in your body. You, 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 you feel on edge all the time. You can change this. And you can also change this and change the dynamic with your parents. And the way that you change the dynamics with your parents is by taking responsibility for how you show up for yourself. There's always kind of two people in a relationship. When you change, the energy that you bring into that relationship is going to change. And they're going to have no choice but to change in reaction to it. That's how this creates a major ripple effect. Because it has held you hostage for far too long, and you have the chance to not only heal yourself, but to heal this pattern that's been passed down through your family. Yeah. What are you thinking? Um, so for right now, we're not really on speaking terms. Yes, okay. they have abused me physically, emotionally, mentally. It, it's bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So since you're not on speaking terms and you're seeking therapeutic help, let's first say this. I am proud of you for getting the help that you need. And I'm Thank proud you. of you for drawing boundaries that put you first. And drawing boundaries that put you first is an example of you believing that you're worthy, and that you deserve to be happy. And that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And when you continue to start to evict the bully that's in your head by naming that bully and talking back to that bully, you will start to hear and reclaim the most powerful voice on the planet, your own. Period. And you don't need to worry about your parents. The time will come, if it ever comes, when you will feel strong enough, confident enough, secure enough, and safe enough to reconnect with them if that's what you choose to do. And if you choose to never do that, that's okay too. Because you deserve to be happy. You do. Okay. What did you get from this conversation? (laughs) Basically, to have more compassion for others as well as myself. Yes. Because part of learning to accept yourself is being compassionate. Compassion for self is super important. You don't have to excuse what somebody did. But when you seek to kind of understand what was going on, both for yourself, for other people, when you bring compassion to it, that's where you open the door to true power for yourself and where you take control and responsibility for what happens in your life moving forward. You get to decide what happens next. And when you start to change the way that you speak to yourself, again, your whole mindset's going to change. And that will be what empowers you to create a new relationship if that's what you decide to do in the future. But what you're doing right now is you're actually working on the most important relationship on the planet. And that's the one you have with yourself. They have beaten her up to a point where she believes everything is her fault. And we're going to talk about the steps she needs to take in order to evict that jerk in her head and program in a positive new soundtrack, one that is all her own, that is empowering. So that's what we're doing today. I invite you to pull up a seat. You are going to laugh. You're going to feel seen. You're going to feel empowered. You're going to leave with tactical tools. And let's get into it with our first coaching session with Poppy. Hi, Poppy. Hi, Mel. How are you? I'm great. Lay it on me, Poppy. Okay. 
I have a question for you. Um, so like, how does one turn off that voice that's, you know, been programmed into our head? Um, telling us that, you know, our needs or emotions don't matter and we must cater to theirs. So like, how do you turn that off? Okay. It's an excellent question. And you don't turn it off. You have to lay a new soundtrack. So okay. if you think about the default mindset, almost like a playlist that runs in the background, that it's almost hard to make it go silent. It's much easier to put a new playlist in there. Right. And so there are two things that, uh, two tricks I'm going to give you. So okay. number one, well, before I get into the tricks, I just want to acknowledge something. Great job recognizing that the default thinking doesn't serve you in your life now. So the fact that you recognize, wow, I have this way of thinking that I don't want in my life and I'm going to do something about it. So that's enormous and it's amazing. Can you tell me what does this default soundtrack sound like? What does it say to you? So it says that, you know, whenever I put myself first and don't put, you know, other people first, I'm selfish. Or if I want to do something for myself, it's never going to succeed. Now, did, but, yeah. some, did somebody tell you that? Yes, my parents, actually. Okay. All right. So thank you for, for like admitting that. And the reason why your parents told you that is because their parents probably told them that. And so they probably thought that they were protecting you. And instead, they sentenced you to a brain and a way of thinking that makes you feel terrible. Right. And so when you can recognize who the programming comes from, it also helps because then you can separate yourself from that voice because it's not your voice. It's your parents' voice. And you have a chance to break this chain. You have the chance to be the one that this playlist dies with. You right. have the chance to create a whole new way of thinking and talking to yourself. And that's incredible. And so the first thing that you said is that you have a belief because somebody programmed this into your mind that runs on default that putting yourself first is selfish. Correct? Right. How does that impact your life? Um, I get burnout, basically. If you could program a different belief, what would the belief be? That, you know, um, um, worth it, basically. It's okay for me to take care of myself. It's okay for me to have emotions. It's okay for me to just be me. Yeah. Oh, I love this. Your whole life's about to change. Because not only is it okay, I deserve to feel how I feel. Right. Like the main mantra I want you to have is, I deserve to be happy. Does this make me happy? I deserve to feel happy. Does this make me happy? What would change in your life if you started to tell yourself over and over every single morning when you start your day, I deserve to be happy today? What would change if you believed that happiness was something you deserved? Wow. Um, I think that my day-to-day -day would be a lot better, basically. I would actually, you know, get to cross off all the lists that I put down on my to-do list. I would have self-confidence. I would be able to go out and have a great day with friends. I, I notice that I hold myself back a lot because of what's been programmed in my head and I'm done with that, you know? 
Well, I'm glad you recognize it. That's a huge step. Most of us sleepwalk through life and don't even realize that we have been trained as little kids to make everybody around us happy and that it's your job to make people happy. It's your job to keep people satisfied. It's your job to make sure nobody's disappointed with you. And part of the problem is, is that underneath what, what your story is, which is it's selfish to put myself first, you have an uglier story. And the uglier story, which I recognize because I had this one too, is people will be mad at me if I put myself first. There will be consequences if I do what's good for me. And so that's what you're really wrestling with, is that you've connected taking care of yourself with somebody pulling their love away. Yes. And that's why you're scared to put yourself first. This goes way deeper. And so you're doing fantastic on behalf of all of us by recognizing that your own thinking is holding yourself back. And I can, I can tell you're just sick of it. And so here's what you have to start to do. Number one, I want you to name the voice. Name it? Yeah, give it a name. Uh. Sally, Sue, Jocko, Raul, oh. uh, Michael. <laughs> we got to name this thing. Oh, boy. Um. Vicky, I guess. <laughs> Vicky, okay. So when this default programming comes up, you're going to talk back to Vicky. Okay. And literally you can even physically, when you feel yourself holding yourself back, that's the signal that this is default programming. You're going to turn toward Vicky. Let me like, literally, I want you to like turn your body and you're going to look as if Vicky's there and you're going to be like, shut up, Vicky. Right. Now I want to hear you do it. Shut up, Vicky. (laughs) Yeah, but if you uh, don't make your boss happy, nobody's going to love you. Mm. Tell her, shut up. Shut up. If you uh, don't do exactly what your parents want, they're going to be disappointed. Shut up. Say it louder. I don't believe you. Shut up. Say her name. Shut up, Vicky. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want to believe this shit Vicky's saying, right? Nope. What do you want to believe? In myself. Yeah. Your parents want you to be happy. They don't know how to make you happy. So they're just telling you what their parents told them. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what people do. You are now an adult. You're not to blame for the crap the malarkey, the garbage, the gunk, the generational trauma shit that your parents put in your brain. You're responsible now that you're an adult for reprogramming this. And so whenever your mind tells you something that you don't want to think, shut up, Vicky. I don't believe that. I believe that if I'm happy, my parents are going to think they won the lottery. I don't believe that. I believe that if I put myself first, I'm going to do better work. Shut up, Vicky. What the hell? You're not paying my rent. Shut up, Vicky. You're not going to the party. I'm not taking you with you. There's no plus one on this invitation. Shut up, Vicky. Like by, by distancing yourself and talking back to it, it loses its power over you. And what also starts to happen is the filter in your brain, the RAS, it's now noticing, oh, you actually care about empowering yourself. And you're going to see more and more reasons to put yourself first. But it really does start with, you got to delete that song. Shut up, Vicky. Shut up, Vicky. Shut up, Vicky. On the playlist in your mind from the past. And you've got to insert the new programming you want to run on default, which is, I deserve to be happy. My parents are proud of me uh, for being me. Nobody's disappointed in me. And if they are, I'm an adult. I can freaking handle it. And... I got to start taking care of myself because I deserve that. Those are your beliefs, period. And whenever you start to feel like, here you go, holding yourself back, shut up, Vicky. And you'll notice the more you do this and you take ownership, 
for programming your mind, the less Vicky's going to show up. Okay. I mean it. Right. I really mean it. If you believed in yourself, what's one change you would make that would improve your life? I would be less intense, I would say. Why are you intense? Because, um, well, just a little story for you. Like, I'm an immigrant, mm -hmm. and so are my parents. And they are very tough on me. They're very toxic because of, you know, culture. And they feel the need to raise me a certain way. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, living in America, what they're doing to me is very toxic and abusive. So I'm just like always living on the edge, basically. Yeah. And if I could just, you know, embrace myself, I think I would be a more relaxed person. Yes. So are you open to some coaching? Yes. So um, a couple things I want to say about this. I agree with you. And when you take on the job of programming your mind to work for you, you will be happier. You will relax. And the reason why you're intense is because you have been trained to believe that at any moment something could go wrong. Right. And that's your lived experience. That is real. That happened. And that is what happened during your childhood. And it will also help you if you can lose the word toxic. Like unless your parents are abusing you, and I don't know that they are or they're not, but if you lose the word toxic and you amplify a little compassion and you say, hmm, I'm not saying what my parents are doing is right. I'm not saying that uh, they didn't cause issues for me emotionally and mentally and psychologically, but they did the best that they could. And I bet it was kind of hard to immigrate here. And I bet it was hard to feel like an outsider. And I bet the stakes felt really high for them. And they felt like outsiders. And they felt like they couldn't mess up. And I bet they took all of that stress that was their lived experience and out of fear and love, they aimed it at you. Right. And the reason why I want you to drop the word toxic is because I see this word thrown all over the internet. And it's a very divisive word, particularly if you want to improve your relationship with the people who are engaged in behavior that feels toxic. And so I think your parents probably did the best they could with their experiences in life and with the situation that they were in, and that if they truly understood what it was like for you as a child, they'd be mortified and horrified, and they'd feel terrible. Is that a fair assessment? Mm, I guess for some parts. Okay. So I don't want to have you have to go in through your whole family history, but if there's, you know, abuse and that kind of stuff, then yeah, that is toxic. And you do need boundaries and you'll figure that out with your therapist. But when mm -hmm. it comes to not adding more pressure on yourself, adding a little compassion so that it doesn't feel so personal and accepting the fact that this was a form of like emotional abuse for you, that you stressed you the hell out. You have this toxic stress in your body. You, 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 you feel on edge all the time. You can change this. And you can also change this and change the dynamic with your parents. And the way that you change the dynamics but with your parents is by taking responsibility for how you show up for yourself. There's always kind of two people in a relationship. When you change, the energy that you bring into that relationship is going to change. And they're going to have no choice but to change in reaction to it. That's how this creates a major ripple effect because it has held you hostage for far too long. And you have the chance to not only heal yourself, but to heal this pattern that's been passed down through your family. Yeah. What are you thinking? 
Um, so for right now, we're not really on speaking terms. Yes, okay. they have abused me physically, emotionally, mentally. It, it's bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So since you're not on speaking terms and you're seeking therapeutic health, let's first say this. I am proud of you for getting the help that you need. And I'm Thank proud you. of you for drawing boundaries that put you first. And drawing boundaries that put you first is an example of you believing that you're worthy and that you deserve to be happy. And that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And when you continue to start to evict the bully that's in your head by naming that bully and talking back to that bully, you will start to hear and reclaim the most powerful voice on the planet, your own, period. And you don't need to worry about your parents. The time will come, if it ever comes, when you will feel strong enough, confident enough, secure enough, and safe enough to reconnect with them if that's what you choose to do. And if you choose to never do that, that's okay too. Because right. you deserve to be happy. You do. Okay. What did you get from this conversation? Ooh. <laughs> Basically, to have more compassion for others as well as myself. Yes. Because... Part of learning to accept yourself is being ca compassionate. Compassion for self is super important. You don't have to excuse what somebody did. But when you seek to kind of understand what was going on, both for yourself, for other people, when you bring compassion to it, that's where you open the door to true power for yourself and where you take control and responsibility for what happens in your life moving forward. You get to decide what happens next. And when you start to change the way that you speak to yourself, again, your whole mindset's going to change. And that will be what empowers you to create a new relationship if that's what you decide to do in the future. But what you're doing right now is you're actually working on the most important relationship on the planet. And that's the one you have with yourself. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mel. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. And thank you for telling me what you told me because you actually saying, wait a minute, I can hear what you're saying, but there was physical abuse here, Mel. That's mm. you putting yourself first. That's another example of how strong you are. Claim that stuff, baby. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you, Mel. <laughs> I love you too. You're awesome. And next up, you're going to hear from a fellow podcast listener who's been impacted by the negativity of narcissism. And she's sick of it. And we're going to talk about what steps she can take and what steps you can take too when we come back. Hey, it's Mel, and I wanted to jump into the middle of that podcast episode you were watching to make sure you knew about a free opportunity that I created for you. It's a new three-part training called Take Control with Mel Robbins. It is packed with science. It is packed with action. It's exactly what you need right now. I know that you are tired of feeling like you're in survival mode. You're tired of merely coping, and it is time to tap back into your excellence and power again. Let me coach you. Let me guide you on the steps that you need to take in order to level up and start executing. It's going to feel so great to start winning again. All you got to do is click on the link right there in the caption. It's melrobbins.com slash take control. It is free. It is for you. And... You need to be in it. Now, let's go back to the podcast. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins. And today we're talking about a mindset reset, which is when you identify the default programming in your mind 
you know that critical voice that's constantly chirping away in the background, you're never good enough, you didn't get it right, you look fat. Once you identify that and that you're sick of it, how can you erase that bully and program a new positive soundtrack in its place? Well, Diane is about to help you do just that. Hi. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing all right. Doing all right. Do have a question for you. I mean, wonderful information from Poppy. My question comes more of what about when this kind of programming and voices are from spouses, friends, employers, you know, and they're just basically building on what your parents or other people have said. Great question. So the question is, what if you've got programming from childhood that now is basically being reinforced by colleagues, bosses, spouses, friend group, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. Yes. What is the kind of default negative thing that you say to yourself? It's definitely not good enough. And who the heck do you think you are? Ooh, the who the heck do you think you are? That has a real bite to it. Um, yes, it does. Yeah, it does. So um, I don't know why I'm going to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you this. Were either of your parents on the narcissism personality disorder by chance? <laughs> Spectrum? Well, I'm pretty close. I would say yes, one of them for sure. And the reason why I say that is because the who do you think you are has a very um, hostile nature to it. So I would imagine, and again, I'm just guessing, just guessing here that there was a level of either hostility or fighting or outbursts or eruptions that were very chaotic for you when you were a little kid happening with the adults in your house. I've blocked out a lot. I, I remember more of my adulthood where I, my ex was a narcissist. I okay. Mean, you know, definitely. Yep. Okay. So I am not surprised that you blocked a lot of childhood out because what happens is that when you're in a situation that is extremely stressful as a young kid because the adults around you can't be trusted or they're erratic, or whatever the situation may be, you live in a state of fight or flight, and the alarm system in your body is going off. And when you are on edge, and the alarm system in your nervous system is going off, because you don't feel safe around the adults in the house, it impairs the cognitive functioning in your brain. This comes from research out of UCLA. Dr. Judith Willis has studied extensively how nervous system dysregulation impacts the brain's ability to function. And so if you're busy managing this toxic stress in your body as a kid, your brain's not actually present to make memories. And so super normal to not have a lot of memories, by the way. I do not have a lot of memories from my childhood, from high school, from college, from law school, because I was in a constant state of anxiety never present in the room to make memories there. And mm -hmm. what I want to tell you first is the good news. So the good news is, even though you have been the victim of being with a narcissist and you have had a childhood that was fraught with all kinds of stuff, you can change your brain. You can learn how to calm your nervous system and you can absolutely change the programming in your mind. And I want you to relate to the programming in your mind as if it was deliberately put there. Because even though mm -hmm. a narcissist or somebody with a narcissistic personality is not deliberately doing this to you, they are so incapable of empathy, they're not even considering you and me. We're objects. They're just doing what they're doing, but we literally get damaged in the way that we think about ourselves when you're around somebody like that, because you think you're the problem. You think mm -hmm. that if there was something different about you, 
then everything would be okay. And lots of people with a narcissistic personality issue, they actually tell you that you're the problem. And so this was a deliberate programming in your mind at the hands of other adults. Now, the good news is you're an adult and you can take deliberate steps to reprogram your mind. And I'm going straight for like boom in the face on this because I want you to realize that you got to get deliberate about this, that Mm -hmm. somebody else trained you to think this way. And it is a level of being deliberate. As if I said, you're going to move to Russia and you got to speak fluent Russian. I realize you've spoken, how old are you? 65. You've spoken English for 65 years. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of your life, we're going to speak Russian. We're going to speak Swahili. We're going to speak a different language. (laughs) And you can learn a different language. And learning to shut off the abusive voice in your head and teaching yourself through thought substitution a different language is what you're going to have to do. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.